Well, hello there and welcome back to another episode of Help My Business is Growing, a podcast where we explore how to grow and build a business that is healthy and sustainable. I'm your host, Kathy Svetina, a fractional CFO and a founder of Newcastle Finance, a company where we believe that everything that you do in your business is eventually going to end up in your finances. And to get to healthy finances is to have a healthy business. How do you get there? Well, this is what this podcast aims to help you with. You know, when businesses struggle, many are tempted to slash their marketing budget. And I see that as a fraction I'll see it for all the time. But it's not a really good move because what happens if you do slash your marketing budget? Your brand can fade into the background, you lose opportunities to engage with your customers, and you risk falling behind your competitors. It's because we know that marketing is a way for you to reach your customers and tell them about your business. But what many don't realize is that marketing is also a powerful tool to control your business and your finances. It can bring you closer to cash and directly impact your bottom line. So the question here is, of course, how do you optimize your marketing spend so that you can get the most out of your money and really give your customers what they want and need versus just, you know, throwing stuff on the wall and see what sticks. So as a quick reminder, all of the episodes on this podcast, including this one, come with timestamps for topics that we discuss and each one has its own blog post. You can find all the links and the detailed topics in this episode show notes. My guest today is Sean Doyle. He is the principal at Fitzmartin Inc., a leading consultancy focusing on sales and marketing and management, sales and marketing technology services, and revenue operations. Sean and his team at Fitzmartin are focused on long-term value creation through a sales first scientific approach to driving revenue. Over 25 plus year career and more than 5,000 engagement, Sean has amassed unmatched expertise in helping B2B companies sell more to their most profitable customers. It's going to be a great conversation. So please join us. Welcome to the podcast, Sean. Hello. It's good to be here. It's been a while. I know it's been it's been a while. <laughs> you know, I'm going to dive right into this because marketing spend is one of the topics that I'm tackling the most these days as a fractional CFO. You know how to spend it, how to optimize the spend, and I'd like to point out here that I said optimize, not cut. <laughs> but there's a diff- big difference, you know, between optimizing and cutting. You guys are always cutting my budgets. I know, I know. Yeah, it, it drives me crazy because I've had so many conversations with marketing is the first thing that gets cut when we have to figure out where to actually get the money from. And how are you supposed to grow when the business doesn't have good marketing? So I can go into a whole rabbit hole with this. So I want to ask you, what is one of the biggest problems that you see when it comes to businesses making decisions on how they should be spending or saving their marketing dollars? What's one of the biggest things that you see out there? Yeah, that's an incredibly good question. I would love to start I can answer this a couple of different ways, but let's start with this. Most of our work at Fitzmartin is to help clients that are in this emerging middle market space that you're so good at, Kathy, and you're so many of your clients. I think what often happens, what I often see is businesses that have yet to discover marketing as a business tool. They think it's an outbound thing that's supposed to get done. And as a result of that, it's a checkbox and it's not often taken seriously at the executive team level. In fact, I would ask you and your listeners right now, I mean, how many of you have marketing representation at the executive team table? That's a great test to see if you really take it seriously. And by seriously, I don't mean, well, we spend money, we take it seriously. I mean, do you see it as somebody that contributes strategically versus get stuff done. The emerging middle market space often will come from where the executive or the shareholder, and if it's family, that's fine. But there's a chief executive typically has held that vision and they've brought in help to to execute on that vision. But at some point, that chief executive has to get other stuff done. It's a pretty big job and they might enjoy marketing because it's visionary in nature and many executives are visionary in nature. So anyway, I, I could ramble on on that for a little bit, but just ask the question, is your marketing team contributing strategically at your executive table? Does your CFO think that, since we're talking about this difference of finance and marketing, does your CFO see value being delivered by whatever marketing resource? So in that emerging space, it's very natural. We see that transition very naturally happen somewhere when a business exceeds maybe 15 to 20 million in 
top line revenue. That's where the stress starts kind of coming in. Uh, and that's where the need for more clear roles comes to play. Somebody over 50 million, that's probably when you start seeing a full-time CMO executive team level. So if you're feeling these tensions in your business, the struggles of seeing things as a cost or an expense, and if your accountant is a cost accountant, you're going to see it as a, as a cost, right? That tension's normal and you're coming up to that barrier and to break through the barrier to the next level, you're going to need an executive team representation of marketing that thinks beyond the doing, the craft of talking and outbound. For example, we helped a client as a fractional CMO, which you're, you're very parallel to what you're doing, identify a new market because there was too much variability in their particular space, in that niche. It was a great niche. It was They were highly well positioned in that niche and they were doing making money in that niche, but but it was tied to an economic radical fluctuations and economic variable. And they needed to stabilize the business. So we were able to work with them to identify what skills, what expertise, what could they do that was very solid and they could have a good go to market. But the goal was not marketing. The goal was to stabilize the finance to stabilize the inflow, to allow the business to have less variability on a month-to-month, year-to-year basis. So just get more control. So marketing should be about control. That's a, that would be my second way to answer the question. If you're seeing marketing as a, a tool to control your business, then you're using it properly. If you see marketing as something we do to communicate outbound messaging, that's not an incorrect use. You're just not using the lever of, of the business tools that you could have. So there'd be two ways I'd answer it. We could, I could come up with a third one, but everybody's going to get bored soon. No, I would want to hear the third one too. I especially like the marketing as a tool because like I said, I see this all the time. When you have a CFO or you even have an accountant that sees marketing as just another cost and... When business gets tough, they want to slash that cost naturally because that's what cost accountants do. That's really their job. I mean, it's it's literally like you're cutting yourself at the kneecaps where you're trying to run a marathon. And it just drives me, like I said, it drives me up the wall that people don't think about marketing as an investment. It truly is an investment. It's not a cost. It's not a slush fund. I always say you want to make sure that the marketing spend that you're putting money in is effective. You want to take a look at that, but not think of it as a slush fund where you can just get the funds for whatever else. So let's let's run down that path a little bit, Kathy. One, I think you should be looking at this as marketing should be able to have a direct impact in regard to cash flow. So when your marketing strategies can directly affect cash flow by accelerating the sales process or condensing the pipeline, that's an impactful thing that every CFO, every finance person should get a hold of and, and enjoy. If you're talking to your marketing team and that concept, what I just said, is like they're looking at you with glazed eyes, then you've probably got a craftsman who's good at creating outbound messaging. And again, that's an important skill. But as a business, you need to be able to say to your marketing team or your marketing leader, let's talk about cash flow. We we've need to accelerate cash flow right now. Okay. Well, great. Why wouldn't you accelerate cash flow? Well, there are reasons to not accelerate cash flow. For example, you may not need the inflow of cash. You may have too many new customers at once that you can't onboard them. You may have, you may be trying to goose your cash flow to look better on the books for external shareholders or external reviews. There's, there's kinds of reasons to do it and not to do it. Another angle of that would be, you could talk about revenue growth. Well, if it's a certain strategic goal uh, for the business to have revenue growth, marketing should be looking at how do we expand that customer base? How do we uh, identify a new market or a new demographic? And then executing the working with sales, of course, execute to that end or innovation around product and market development play into that role at revenue growth. Profitability is obviously something important. I literally sat in a meeting this morning where we were looking at setting up a parts store in an e-commerce fashion to serve current clients of one of our clients. And we can identify the 60% of SKUs 
that have the most margin. Well, why would we not be promoting the highest margin parts? And why would we not identify, for example, something like a warranty that's almost passed through to net income and start cross promoting that? Why would we not identify ways? And the shareholder wants this too, right? Let's just transition to shareholder value. Again, the ways I think a marketer should be thinking, we break it into two parts. Uh, There should be a speed to cash effort. I was talking to a steel manufacturer in Mexico this week, and they were bored stiff with everything I had to say about marketing and branding and all this stuff. And then I said, now we do have a program called, and they were even giving me kind of the pat on the head, like we're going to meet internally and we'll get back to you, which we all know means go away, marketing guy. You're talking about marketing stuff. But then I said, well, you know, there's something that when we work with PE firms, when they bring us in, they want us to have a speed to cash mindset. And we have a specific program built around how to do that very thing. Would you be interested in hearing about that? And it was like, you could just see like the energy came back up. Everybody in the room was like, yeah, tell us more about that. Because I was then talking about what they cared about and they had a speed to cash problem. They'd had a bad year last year. They needed the cash. They needed a quick way to get there. And the way we work at Fitzmartin, and I'll give you my, here's our secret sauce. One of the things we do, we call selling backward. So selling backward, what's that mean? I'd say 90%, and this is also probably every executive listening is going to go, yeah, I'm frustrated with my marketing spend. But 90, and here's why. 90% of your marketers start work as far away from cash as they possibly can. And they're going to call it something like lead generation, or we're going to build awareness. Like that's literally as far away from a, a cash register as you can get. What we do is we sell backward. We work and look at the data. We analyze and work with sales and identify the target groups that are as close to cash as possible. And let's start marketing there. We might not at all elevate a business's awareness that they exist for a year because we're focused on who's close to cash. How do we identify those people? How do we step alongside of sales and develop and help those people remove the obstacles and help those people over the finish line? And that has proven to be an incredibly powerful tool. So again, I'm going to, here's another test. If you can say these things to your marketing firm, then you've probably got a good executional craft firm, and that's not uncommon. If you can't, then you just need to elevate the leadership you have so that they can talk through these kinds of strategies. Shareholders seem to care about these things, and there's that short-term speed to cash they care about, and there's that longer-term value in brand equity. Most people, if I talk to them about longer term value building, get glaze over because it just sounds like marketing talk. Most people, especially the people like you, Kathy, if I start talking about speed to cash, even your eyes lit up. You're, you thought of somebody when I said that. You did. I saw dollar signs coming. Yeah, <laughs> you did. And it just makes sense. This is a business tool. This is not an art tool. We happen to use art, so it gets confusing, (laughs) but it's a business tool and it should be. Anyway, that's, that's a, that's a lot. Did that help answer any of your questions? It did. It did. It really, it really shows that, you know, how good marketing impacts the business because what I'm seeing out there, you know, from from the financial standpoint, there's a lot of like brand awareness and awareness activities, which is all great on the long term scale. Obviously, you know, you want to have that brand awareness, you want to build a brand, but that takes a very, very long time. And if your business needs to bring in the money yesterday, like how do we get there? How do we use the marketing to use that as a tool to get us to get that cash injection? So let's talk about bad direction from the executive team to the marketing team based on what you just said. I need you guys to bring in cash quickly and I want you to build long-term value and we need to cut budgets. (laughs) That's terrible. You just, you gave me two objectives and you can do both. You can do a speed to cash work while building long-term value, but they're very different methodologies. You've got to approach them very differently. Here's another request I got from a company in Atlanta we're working with. They said, we need to actually, it's not even, we're not working with them quite yet. And they said, we've decided we want to do an RFP and we're one of the sections or segments of that RFP says, we need to have a social media presence. So I said, okay, 
that's great. So I hit reply and said, thank you for the RFP. We don't usually fill these things out. And what we typically do is we have a strategic session before we work with somebody to understand what the goals are. For example, the social media thing you're wanting a budget on, I can't give you a real number now because I don't know if you're doing brand building. I don't know if you're trying to influence your HR pipeline. I don't know if you're doing social media around a demand gen technique to sell a particular product or service. I don't know what your social media is trying to achieve. So saying social media is meaningless. So how could anybody, any marketer that would give you a number without understanding your business objective is just making up stuff? And I'm trying to control my language. You've got to understand when you give a marketer a bad direction too, then you've got to understand that they should be answering with questions not budgets back. But like you've had social media is just such an easy one to pick on because I don't know what you're doing. If it's a demand gen platform, meaning I'm trying to drive people in a thought leadership manner to understand more about a particular product or service, then great. I know how to do that. I can give you the structure between the thought leadership content piece to the 50 pieces of content that we're going to flow out of that. And then it even points me to the platform. We're probably not going to do a lot of Instagram. We're going to do a lot of LinkedIn. Oh, wait, you're trying to build your HR pipeline because employee turnover is a problem for you. Okay, great. Now I know I need to do brand culture and I need to understand core values. And I'm trying to probably use Instagram and Facebook more to reach a geographic area around your facilities where you're trying to hire people. I mean, you see, I could bid on that although I wouldn't bid on it, I could price that out versus give me some social media. So we get bad. I'm saying marketers get bad direction often. And then it's a, it's a foregone conclusion. If you get bad direction, if you don't know the questions to ask back, then you're going to have bad outcomes and you get fired and you move on. Think about it this way. Kathy, if you went to your doctor and said, let me tell you, I really think I need this particular medicine because of, you know, my elbow hurts and I play a lot of tennis. So what I want you to do is prescribe me a PT, an ice bag and these three meds. What should your doctor do? Well, if you have a good doctor, they'll say, stop reading WebMD and Google your stuff. <laughs> right. Why don't you just talk to me first to right. figure out whether you actually need that? Right. And let me be the doctor. You be the patient. <laughs> I don't. So, you know, if you, what's the great uh, management consultant? I always misquote him. Um, as Michael Porter, but uh, you have a perfect system for doing what it is you're doing now. So when you tell your marketing team to do stuff and it doesn't work, it's you, man. <laughs> it's, you you were the doctor, and guess what? It, your your diagnosis wasn't correct. So a good a, a good. I just encourage anybody, and, and I can't. I'm I'm not on this podcast to try to get all the business, get all Kathy's clients to call me. There's lots of good marketers, but get one that asks a question back. Get one that when you tell them what to do, they say. Thank you, Kathy. I'm just so interesting that you want to do social media. Tell me a little bit more. Tell me what your goals are. Tell me what your objective is. How will that impact your business? Kathy, is that measurable financially to you? Oh, yeah, we can, you know, we, if we can fix our employee turnover, that costs us about $160,000 per person per year. And if we can reduce that by 10%, that's $300,000 or whatever the number is. And now, oh, okay, so if we're going to save you $300,000, would it make sense to spend $100,000 to solve that? Okay, great. We just did a budget without knowing anything about what we are going to do because the budget was based on the value to the business. That's a much better conversation. And Kathy, the CFO is happy. <laughs> yes, yes, very happy. But that's really the difference between the marketing that is order taker and the marketing that is strategic. Absolutely. So when you're hiring people like this, whether it's a marketing agency or whether you're looking for someone who's a fractional CMO, the chief marketing officer, like what are some of the questions that you can ask them in that interview process to truly understand whether they're the order taker or whether they're just being strategic, especially if you don't really understand marketing yourself? Yeah, that's an incredibly good question. And this is going to sound like I'm selling a book. So I wrote one of the worst selling books in the history of book writing. It's called Shift. I think there's still a copy of it on Amazon. And if if it's not there anymore, then just 
send me an email and I'll send you one. I've got a few cases of them left over. Every first time author is sure that they're going to sell thousands of books and very few do. But in this book, it's, and ironically enough, I didn't market the book correctly, but that's a whole nother story, Kathy. That was a bad ROI. This In this book, chapter four, if I remember, gives you the questions to ask in that setting. Broadly speaking, what I would do is I would ask Kathy, you want, you want to be our CMO? That's great. Give them a problem of some sort. Give them, give Kathy a real business problem and see how Kathy answers. And if Kathy answers with tactics, oh, you know, Facebook's great for that. Or, oh, we got to build a website. Okay. They're revealing what's in their head and heart with that tactical expression. If you get a tactical answer, then you're talking to a tactical person. If you get a strategic answer, meaning that's interesting. You want to solve this problem. Tell me what it means to the business. How important is this to you? How much money do you think you could make or, or are you losing a year? those kinds of questions, then that would be a good sign that you're talking to a strategic person. So I would ask something simple, give a problem and listen, are they giving strategic or are they giving tactical answers? And that'll pretty quickly reveal itself. That's really good because you know what they say, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's a, a, a challenge. You know, the old fashioned term is integrated marketing where multivariant marketing or, you know, there's, there's all kinds of phrases for it. But you really do, I believe, a good CMO is somebody who understands a touch about everything. They're not good at anything. <laughs> I am not good at anything, but I've got about 53 people at my resources in my resource pool that are really good at narrow things. And that's what I want from a CMO, somebody who can understand business, talk about what's your return on marketing investment, what's your customer acquisition cost, what's your marketing as a percentage of customer acquisition cost. Those kinds of simple metrics are super easy. Kathy, you could give me, you could use those three and get a good start to any kind of dashboard that you're building for any of your clients. Those are the three I would point you to. Those, those are, you know, you don't have to know a ton to know to ask those questions, to understand finance. I like to say, nobody has ever hired me for what I do. What do you mean by that? Nobody wants marketing. Everybody wants the results of marketing. Nobody wants marketing. <laughs> Why would you buy marketing? Unless you just like websites. No, nobody wants a website. No, people want the result of a website. And that's probably another thing that's important for an executive to understand. If you buy marketing, you get marketing. If you buy the results of marketing, then, then you're pointing toward a different thing. And I think this is very similar to any of the other fractional rule. Like if you really truly have a fractional CMO, a fractional COO, a fractional CFO like myself, we are good at a lot of things. And but you can see the business holistically. You want those roles to see the business holistically and to see where how everything connects together. We might not be great at like, for example, you know, at SEO or what it could be like copywriting. You have people specialized for that, but there is definitely a value to have someone who can look at all these different ways of what can happen so that you contribute to the business in the right way and actually manage those resources for you. The same thing on the finance side as well. For example, you know, I don't do tax preparation. I definitely do not do bookkeeping. I know a little bit about all of those things that I can manage people in there, but I know how to connect the dots between the sales, the marketing, the operations, the finance people and move that together. So it's, it's really important that when you have people in these fractional roles that you hire the right people that are strategic, that they can help drive the business forward. So that's my little soapbox right here. <laughs> That was great. Can I flip the table and keep you talking? <laughs> it's about you, not about me. <laughs> oh, that's true. But you're, you've are you got the finance mind. Let me ask you this one question. Do you think that you should budget based on top line revenue or some variant of EBITDA? That's a great question. And my answer to that would be it depends. <laughs> <laughs> ah, come on now. <laughs> I think it's an interesting question. I recently had a client pose it to me. She's a brilliant CMO. And I've always preferred top line revenue because my work in marketing is so closely attributed or attributable to top line revenue. There's just a connection there that's undeniable. There's so many things that by the time you're down to EBITDA, 
that can play a factor in there that is, I just think it's murkier, but she had the polar opposite opinion. So I'm trying to help you be be my teacher so I can be smarter next time I talk to Amy because th- she really has this other opinion and she's pretty good. <laughs> That's interesting. What is her take on why should EBITDA be taken into consideration when I think I think she's saying and and it's I can't argue this I I think she's saying it's closer to what the shareholder cares about than top line revenue and you can make an argument that top line revenue is meaningless my argument would be top line revenue is meaningless if you don't manage everything in between the net income to the top but that's not all my responsibility so if production is just terrible then you know I, we could have done demand forecast they could have bought the right inventory but they didn't have the capacity in production so that would mean I brought the wrong revenue in or too much revenue or revenue that wasn't at a high enough uh, gross margin to make it flow through to the net income line. But I, I just think arguably she's right, right? Even is closer to the net income line and that's what shareholders want. So I don't know. I just thought I'd play with that. Yeah, there, there's a lot of variables in the EBITDA and EBITDA means earnings before interest, depreciation and amortization for anyone that doesn't know that term. So as you said, there's a lot of stuff that happens in between once you get the revenue and all the other costs, all the operations, the HR, all the IT spend or whatever you might have. So there's just a lot of variables in there. There's definitely a good argument there that that's where shareholders care about. However, as I said, it really depends on what type of industry the business is in and how the business is structured. And I think that needs to be taken into consideration. So I, my personal opinion is that you two are both right, depending on the business that you're working with. <laughs> okay. I'll tell Amy that I spoke with an expert and yes, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. If I'm listening to your podcast, I just want somebody to tell me like, what should I spend? My marketing guy tells me something and I don't know if I can trust him or not. My CFO, you know, dang, Kathy's a penny pincher and she's just trying to cut budget. And I'm not sure she's right either. So what's the truth? Where does the truth lie? And I, I should have asked you beforehand, but I'm glad to share with any of your listeners, Kathy, I built a spreadsheet that's all built around third party data. It's built around Gartner, Deloitte, Wall Street Journal, Duke Fuqua School, and some other resources to build all kinds of, show all kinds of different numbers. I think that if you do a top line revenue model, then I think you're looking somewhere typically between maybe three, four, five percent if you just want to maintain the status quo of top line revenue. And we see growth, an average marketing budget. I'm focused mostly on B2B, B2B product and B2B service. Average budgets are six, seven, eight percent in that space. And if you're consumer, you know, you're looking at more like 13, 14% of revenue. So there's a, a widely varying set of numbers and there's about 20 numbers on, as on this sheet I'm looking at, but it's a simple plug model. It gives you some visibility. And I, I think the reason I built this was somebody asked me once, it's fine that you have all these arguments inside a business about how much you're spending. But if you drove in a NASCAR race and all you looked at was your own dashboard, would you have any idea how you were doing? I have a very strong opinion about benchmarks and looking at the industry standards and stuff and other companies. Very, very strong. I like to look at it as informative, but I'm always cautioning businesses not to get married to it. Because if we're just looking, for example, you know, 10% of marketing, at two and a half million top revenue, which is fine. But the problem is we don't know how effective that is. And are they truly using the right marketing people? Do they have, just like we talked about, tacticians, not someone who's strategic? And they're just throwing money on the fire. Yeah. Are we benchmarking? (laughs) We're benchmarking against a thousand lemmings who are all running to the edge of the cliff, right? Exactly. Like, are are we just throwing, you know, mud on the wall and trying to see what sticks? Or are we truly looking at the marketing strategically and figuring out what actually works for the business? And the other thing I have, when you're comparing numbers to the other companies, you don't know what exactly is in there. So does that 10%, does that include the salary of your other marketing people? Or is it just ad spend? Right. Or is it the fractional CMO that's included in there? Right. Where does that stand? Good question. So that's that's my argument for that. Yeah. And I wouldn't say that's an argument against what I said. And I think the answer is if you're racing, if you and I are racing in, in NASCAR and one of us is only looking at the dashboard, then we're, we don't know if we're being lapped or if we're in the lead. And if one of us is only looking out the windshield, 
we don't know if we if our engine is about out of gas or not. And the answer is yes, both. It's helpful to have some benchmarking, and but it's not the only guide. And it's really wise to look at your own dashboard because your situation is unique. And I could give you the example of that breaks the, the benchmark. We have a highly performing client who is spending about a third of what industry averages are. And I know for a fact they're outpacing their competitors significantly. And I wouldn't tell them to spend a nickel more or a nickel less. But they're, if they were all they were doing is looking at benchmarks, then it wouldn't be helpful. But if they do look at their inter, looking at their internal dashboards, it's helpful once in a while to go, oh, you know what? We're spending a third. We're performing very well against our competitors. Okay. Now, the more important numbers are, are we passing enough through to shareholders? Are we hitting our internal targets? And the, the other variable that is very easy to not understand or monetize is, let's say we were working for a very, very well positioned company, whereas there ain't nobody in the world that sells what we sell, which is always going to be an exaggeration. But that marketing budget should be pretty small. If it's a well positioned company, that is your marketing budget. The positioning is your marketing budget. The, the investment in your product and maintaining market share, for example, if you had 80% market share, I actually have a, a prospect right now who has 70 to 80 percent market share and they don't want to talk about it because they're so strong (laughs) but they're and they do some marketing but then they're starting to look at other purposes of marketing i mean what do you do when you have 70 percent of market share it's not that's that's pretty strong well there are answers there right your marketing might look more like innovation programs to protect your share for the future and also probably um to attract the people that you want to hire as well. Exactly. You're thinking of more of it as a tool for hiring than attracting customers. Well, it, it, we've covered people and money. I think those are the two easiest parts of anybody's job. <laughs> It, well, yeah, that was, yeah, that was not the, true. The, the easiest of uh, of <laughs> all of them. So, Sean, this has been absolutely a delightful conversation. I mean, we went through so many things, but you know, if someone is looking at their marketing and they're trying to get to that strategic marketing that we've talked about, that you talked about so well on on this podcast episode, and you gave us so many great examples too, but they have no idea like how to get there. What is the one thing that they can do in the next couple of weeks to fine tune their marketing? Marketing, obviously, there's going to take a while. But what is the one next step that they can do something actionable? Well, obviously, buy something from me. <laughs> no, that's not. That's, that's not the answer. That is not the answer. Um, <laughs> no, I think the smartest thing, I am uh, old enough and of, of enough substance to believe that I can't help everybody in the world. So I, I try to have a generous idea or mindset. Uh, we have spent a tremendous amount of time building uh, some intellectual property we call it centricity, which really is nothing more complicated than a statement of buyers have to be at the center of everything you do. And that means your sales team, your marketing team, your customer service team, and then the technology stack that represents, is represented by those four, or represents all of those that the buyer lives in from a CRM record standpoint. Those four points of view all have to be aligned to the buyer. Now, the interesting thing, Kathy, is when you do that, sales and marketing end up aligned to each other. Think about it. If you try to align sales and marketing to each other, you can do that. A lot of people talk about that. And the outcome of that is seems clear. But my supposition is who cares if your buyers or your sales and your marketing teams are aligned? You left out the buyer. <laughs> let's let's just align everybody to the buyer. And then the outcome of that will be sales and marketing will be aligned. Let's align customer service to the buyer. And then the buyers will have their needs met, you know, and sales and marketing all understand the same language because they understand the same person, the buyer. So if you can do that, then you've got a great tool. So I would encourage you, we have built fitsmartin.com slash free help, fitsmartin, F-I-T-Z-M-A-R-T-I-N.com slash free help. And on that, you can download Centricity, you can download the framework and just start by looking at that framework and 
think about your uh, th- your questions. There's some other free help stuff there that I think is kind of cool. And I think there's a video there that explains centricity a little bit more deeply. But it, just if the one thing, if I could do one thing to help everybody, it would be just to get them aligned to the buyer, not to each other. And you're and you're you'll make money by doing that. Easy peasy. <laughs> really hard. <laughs> I've got a friend who's a film director, and he says what I do is incredibly simple. And very, very hard. Yeah. I think that's the, what this is. Buyer alignment is incredibly simple and really hard. So we're going to put all of those uh, links in the show notes as well. So Sean, I'm assuming people can find you on your website, anywhere else that you live on the interwebs. All the obvious LinkedIn stuff and all that. And uh, feel free to shoot me an email. It's just Sean, S-E-A-N at fitzmartin.com. And I'll be glad to send you a copy of the book if you want one. I'll charge Kathy for it. Don't worry about it. (laughs) And uh, I'll send you the spreadsheet, this third-party validation, or or look out the at the dashboard out the window. Any of this stuff that I that we've talked about today, I'm more than glad to share with you. And I promise it's not a sales trick. So just glad to share stuff. And um, I hope I can be helpful to folks. So thank you. Yeah, it's, and it's Sean M. Doyle, S-E-A-N-M, letter M, Doyle, D-O-Y-L-E. Thank you for having me on the show, Kathy. You have such a great show and an interesting uh, segment that you work in. And you're obviously so smart and add so much value to them. I hope but this was of some help to you. Yeah, it sure was. Thank you so much, Sean. And it was very delightful. Thank you. Thank you. 